Thank you, Tamara. Uh, good morning, everyone who's here, and good morning to those who are watching online. We're so excited that you could join us. Uh, how many of you guys love celebrating your birthday? A few people. All right, all right. Uh, Dave Clark actually celebrated his birthday last Sunday, and he is officially 88 years old. You would never know it because he could outrun all of us. How many of you have been celebrating the same birthday forever? Like you are forever 29 or forever 39 or whatever it is. I mean, you've been celebrating it so long, your kids don't even know how old you really are. No, oh, they do. They do. All right. All right. Uh, I saw a couple of funny tweets this last week that gave an indication of to let you know whether you're old or not. So let's just kind of check this out. One way to find out if you're old is to fall down in front of a group of people. If everyone laughs, you're young. And if they panic, you're old. That's one way to know. You're old if you understand the origin of hang up the phone. We still use the phrase, but it means nothing to smartphones. You're old if you can hurt yourself while sleeping. I've done that. You're old if you go from left knee and right knee to good knee and bad knee, or bad knee and worse knee. You're old if you can remember a time where you went a whole day without taking a picture. Mm -hmm. Last one, you're old if your back goes out more than you do. I am officially middle-aged. I turned 45 this past week, and thank you. And for me, it was a big deal because my dad passed away when he was 44, and so the age of 44 has always just kind of haunted me. It's always just been this kind of black cloud. And, uh, and so now I'm 45, I'm still alive, I'm ready to thrive as long as it's past or before five. Yeah. <laughs> While we grow older physically, we're supposed to grow older spiritually. We're supposed to grow in wisdom, well, we might develop gray hair, liver spots, and acid reflux from just looking at spicy stuff, we're supposed to be defined by the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5, 22 through 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. When you look at your life, how many of these nine characteristics define you? Are they the words that your friends and family use to describe you? I feel good about eight of them. I'm good at joy. I'm good at kindness. I'm all right at gentleness. But there's one that I'm not very good at. When you look at a list of the fruit of the Spirit, which one do you struggle with most? Is it love? Is it peace? Is it joy? Is it kindness? Is it goodness? Is it gentleness? Is it faithfulness? Is it self-control? Or is it the one that I deliberately left out? The one that I struggle with the most? Patience. How many of you struggle with patience? Autocorrect can ruin my whole day. I hate autocorrect. For how many of you, patience is the thing you struggle with the most? A dad said, I'm running out of patience. His seven-year-old says, Dad, I've never seen you run anywhere. <laughs> now we can see why he's running out of patience. To which the dad says, I'm walking out of patience. 96% of Americans are so impatient that they will eat or drink something hot rather than let it cool off and then burn their mouths. 96%. 72% will get in an elevator, and even though the light is already lit up, they will sit there and press the door button, though it doesn't make it any faster. 50% honk their car horn if they're at a green light and the car in front of them doesn't move fast enough. It's called a honko second. how long it takes before the light turns green and you're hitting that horn. I watched as a truck blew through a light the other day, there was a student driver in front of them, and it had the billboard on top of it, student driver, and he's just honking his horn at this poor kid. I'm like, why would you do that? They're already nervous. You're so impatient. A few weeks ago, we started talking about how to win at life. Week one, we discovered that we are winning in all the areas in which we've surrendered to God. That if there's an area in our life that we've not surrendered, that's an area that we are losing in life. 
Week two, we talked about how uh, we discovered that we have to fight for the promises of God. That they are not automatic. That they are conditional statements. If you do this, then God will do that. Well, today I want to focus on patience with God's process. Patience with God's process. Notice there was no amens. We all want God's promises, but we don't want God's process. We want God's wallet, but we don't want God's watch. We want his resources. We want his stuff, but we don't want his timing. We've been looking at Psalm 37, where David famously says in verse 4, commit your way to the Lord, trust him, and he... That's not the right one. Go ahead, don't put that up there. Thank you. It threw me off. Delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart. Delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart. Seven times in the short psalm, David refers to the land that God promised to the Israelites from the Negev wilderness in the south to the Lebanon mountains in the north, from the Euphrates River on the east and the Mediterranean Sea on the west. God promises them all this land. Like Indiana Jones, they travel by map, and God shows them what it is that they will be able to have if they will do some things. But it will take more patience than a millipede putting on their shoes in the morning. They have 300 to 700 legs, just for those who don't know. All right, I, it's funnier if you know. All right, I want us to look at Psalm 37, verse 5 and 6, and we're going to unpack this this morning. Commit your way to the Lord, trust in him, and he will do this. He will make your righteous reward shine like the dawn. Everyone say dawn. dawn. Your vindication like the noonday sun. Say noonday sun. Notice that there's time between when the promise starts to be fulfilled, dawn, and when the promise is completely fulfilled, noonday sun. It's actually quite a beautiful poetic statement. The promise starts with dawn, the first appearance of light in the morning, and ends with the noonday sun when the sun is at its brightest or at its peak. There are at least 450 years from the moment that Joshua steps into the promised land, takes over the first city, to when Solomon comes and expands their borders to the furthest reaches. There's 450 years from the beginning of the promise to the fulfillment of the promise, the dawn and then the noonday sun. The promise came at the speed of their obedience and their readiness, and that's something key we need to understand. The promise came at the speed of their obedience and their readiness. That's why Psalm 37 verse 7 says, Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. There's going to be time between the dawn and the noonday sun of the fulfillment of his promise. While we're waiting on God to bring the promise, God is often waiting on us to be ready for the promise. While we're waiting on God for the promise, he's waiting on us to be ready for the promise. The Hebrew word for patient is savla nut. I know all of you guys are very familiar with that. It's your bumper sticker. I know you got it. It comes from the word savel, which means pain. Waiting can be painful, anyone. Patience can be painful. In the 1980s, the first word an immigrant would learn on their way to Israel would be savla nut because everything was a very slow, painful process. For example, to get your phone line would take five to eight years. To get your phone line in the 80s would take five to eight years in Israel. A person put... Uh, oh. A person put this picture up on uh, Twitter this last week, and I think it describes kind of where we're at these days, what it's like to track your package these days. And you just got to hear, it's just a, out in the ocean somewhere, you have no idea when it's going to come to you. We have to be patient with people, processes, and pain. My wife and I were at a restaurant this last week when I looked out the window and I saw the planet Venus. You can see the moon and you can see the planet Venus, there it is right there. And, uh, and she's trying to look, and because of her degenerative disease, she can't see things at night. And so she's frustrated. She can't see what's going on. So I take a picture of it so I can scroll it out so that she can see a closer look. And I'm pointing out, you know, this is Venus. And, and I have to do that a lot for her. If there's a rainbow or if there's a hawk, uh, there's something too difficult to see, like my son's mustache. I have to take a picture, and I have to blow it up for her so that she can see that, yes, indeed, there is a mustache there. 
Navigating ongoing pain takes patience. Any of you deal with something that's an ongoing struggle, an ongoing challenge, it takes patience. Which is why patience was often translated as long-suffering. We don't use that phrase that much anymore, but it used to be translated as long-suffering. The word patience only appears 16 times in the NIV, and yet reasons for patience are on every page of the Bible. We are called to a life of patience. So what is patience? Someone joked that patience is what you have when there are too many witnesses. That's patience. I think the best translation is that patience is not the ability to wait. It's the ability to wait with a good attitude. Patience isn't just the ability to wait. It's the ability to wait with a good attitude. I wrote down, patience is waiting in a state of more worship than worry. It's waiting in a state of more worship than worry. It's why Proverbs 19.11 says, A person's wisdom yields patience. It is to one's glory to overlook an offense. There's glory in the ability to have patience. We live in a world where we're constantly having to wait. Someone wrote recently, I don't mind waiting on God to bring me my soulmate. I just wish he would give me the tracking number. (laughs) It might be in the ocean. It's on one of those cargo ships. Patience. Uh, I'm an author. And one of the things I hate about writing is that it's 10% writing and 90% waiting. So it's this constant, open-ended, is it going to happen? Is it not going to happen? I wrote a 25-day Christmas devotional back in September. I was thinking about Christmas at the same time Hobby Lobby was, which was the day after last Christmas. And I was like, December 26th, all right, thinking about the next one. And I submitted it to to Moody uh, two months ago, uh, working on it, and then every day I'm checking the email. Is it a yes? Is it a no? Is it a sorry? You got the wrong number. Dan Stanford who? We don't know who you are. This week, I found out that my devotional, The Adventures of Christmas, is on you version. That should be exciting. Is on you version. <laughs> it is the largest Christian platform out there right now. They have a half billion followers, so maybe that's more exciting for you. Um, and you can download it for free, but not right now because we're going to talk about patience. God is known for making us wait. Sarah was 65 years old when God told her that you're going to be pregnant. And Sarah was like, what did I ever do to you? (laughs) Haven't I been a faithful servant? I mean, 65, really? You know, that's not really on my radar. I've I've been praying about that for a couple decades. God says at 65, you're going to get pregnant. But guess how old she is when she actually has the baby? 90. So he comes to her at 65, says, I'm going to give you a baby, and now you're going to have to wait until you're 90. That's 25 years worth of waiting. 90 is when your kids should be taking care of you, you not taking care of kids. You should be looking at nursing homes, not nurseries. You know, they could go shopping for diapers together. (laughs) Huggies for you, depends for me. I mean, like 90 is not the time to be having a baby. Why does she have to wait 25 years when she's already waited so long? There's always a spiritual cause behind the physical pause. There's always a why behind the why, the, the when. David was a teenager when he was first told that he would be king. When he turned 18, did he get the crown? No. He would have to wait until he was 30 years old to get part of Israel, just Judah. He would have to wait until he was 37 before he became the king of all of it. He waits over 20 years for the promise to become a possession or a fulfillment. Jacob waits 14 years to marry Rachel. Could you imagine being engaged for 14 years? No. (laughs) Jesus waits until he's 30 to start his ministry. Jesus did not come to planet Earth because we needed a better carpenter. And yet he will spend most of his life doing that, waiting on God's timing for then a three-year ministry. Waiting. We all have things that we have to wait for. Say amen if this is something you wait on. Teenagers. Healing. A marriage or relationship to be restored. A future spouse. Teenagers. 
an answer to prayer, direction, guidance, a loved one to come home to God, a financial breakthrough, teenagers, freedom, justice, fulfillment of a dream, fulfillment of a promise, teenagers. If you have teenagers, there's a lot of waiting. I have written most of my sermons while waiting on one of my teenagers. Sometimes the promises are so big, you have to grow into it. Sometimes the promise is so big, you have to grow into it. Imagine that this pair of pants right here is the promise of God. <laughs> like I say, whose closet I broke into? <laughs> If I try to put these on now, they're going to fall down, I'm going to trip, you're going to laugh, and I'm going to hurt myself. I have to grow into these, which is never going to happen. (laughs) Maybe, maybe, I mean, you know, metabolism is slowing down, but not that slow. God promises Israel land, but he says, you're not able to manage it yet. You're not able to manage it yet. In fact, he tells them in Exodus chapter 23, verse 28 through 30, I will send the hornet ahead of you to drive out the Hivites, Canaanites, and Hittites out of your way, but I will not drive them out in a single year because the land would become desolate and the wild animals too numerous for you. Little By little, I will drive them out before you until you have increased enough to take possession of the land. You are not able to fit into the promise yet. You are not grown enough to take possession of what I have for you. You need to grow into the promise of God. Some of us are frustrated. Like, God, why won't you give me the promise? And God's saying, grow up. You have some growing to do in order to handle what it is I want to do in your life. You're waiting on me, but I'm waiting on you. We live in a world of false promises. Red Bull will not give you wings. Pepsi free isn't free. Just try walking out the store with one of them. My wife and I ordered a couple of large drinks recently. Large drinks recently. To which the barista asked us if we would like a straw. And we said, yes, please. And they said, we're all out of large straws. (laughs) Then why are you offering me that little straw? (laughs) I mean, this cup, I could baptize someone in it. And you're handing me a coffee stirrer. It makes no sense. God doesn't make false promises. Remember last week we talked about God won't make a promise he can't do. But he will make a promise he won't do if you don't meet the conditions. Between the promise and possession is time, which requires patience. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 12. Through faith and patience, they inherited the promises. Through faith and patience, they inherited the promises. I was driving through Waukegan the other day, and I saw the first church I ever served at. And I was reminded as I was driving past it that I was going to have the opportunity to be the youth pastor. And then they said no. They hired in some guy from the outside, and I had to wait a year till that guy left to then I got to be the youth pastor. But I wasn't ready for it when the first opportunity came. I thought I was ready for it, and I was mad. Why did you pick that guy rather than me? I would have worked cheaper. But God knew I wasn't ready. I had to grow into the promise. We win at life when we trust in God's process, that what he promises and when he promises are equally important. That what he promises and when he promises. For my birthday, my wife took me to a spa. Before I got the back massage, I told the person, and I'm not into people touching me, a hug is fine. I might grimace a little bit, but I'll do it. But I tell the person, I'm like, if, if, if you're hovering your hand over me as a one, and like light creepy touches a two, I want a three. 
I don't want to feel like pizza dough. And you're like, woo, pastor it in. Like, I, don't, I don't want like, you like, working me over. Just like a light, you know, and then we're good. You get paid the same anyways. But then I started thinking as I was going through this experience about the verse where, where Scripture says that God's the potter and we're the clay. And how often we try to reverse it and we try to make him the clay and we're the potter. And we try to tell him how to do his job. God, I don't want a one and I don't want a two, but if you could do a three, that would be perfect. And God says, I'm God, you're not. I know what you're ready for and I know what you're not ready for. I know you're frustrated, but you should be frustrated with yourself. This is, there's some growing that needs to take place. If you trust that God is sovereign, that he has purpose behind the process, it's a lot easier to be patient. What are you waiting for God to do in your life these days? We win when we trust the process, when we trust that God is always at work. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 28 through 29 says, Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. God will not grow tired or weary. God, like Sylvester Stallone, doesn't seem to age. <laughs> I mean, he's still making Rambos and Rockies and just keeps going on and on. The same power that God uses to flex when he says, let there be light, is the same power he has when he performs the 150 miracles throughout Scripture. He doesn't lose his power. He doesn't lose his strength. He's not the siesta savior. Well, one third of our lives will be spent sleeping, and we love it. We love sleep. Trust me, at 45, you love sleep. I love the quote that says, a day without a nap is like a cupcake without frosting. <laughs> amen. I knew there was an amen out there. God has never taken a nap. Not a power nap, not a disco nap. He doesn't take vacations. He doesn't say TMI, TMIF. Think me, it's Friday. <laughs> He's never blinked. He's never sneezed. Well, Genesis 2 says that God rested on the seventh day. Guess what? That wasn't for him. That was for us. To teach us the rhythm that our lives should follow. Humanity needs rest. God does not. In fact, when we sleep, it is a reminder that we are created in God's image, but we are not God. That while we sleep, he works. He continues to make the world go round. And while the world keeps spinning, God's kingdom keeps winning. We can rest because God promises to never rest. God is never too tired for you. He doesn't yawn while you're praying. He's not like Rip Van Winkle or Sleeping Beauty or Garfield the Napping Cat. There's a scene in the life of Elijah who is a prophet. And the prophets of Baal are, are having this contest to see whose God is real. And the prophets of Baal are shouting and screaming and dancing like a worship service at the well. It's just intense. Like, like you're jazzercising for Jesus. Amen. Amen. And Elijah sarcastically says in 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 27, Shout louder! Surely he is a God. Perhaps he is deep in thought or busy, or traveling. Maybe he's sleeping and must be awakened. The Hebrew word that he used for the break there is the little boy's room. A potty break. English translation, we tried to soften it, but that's really what's going on there. Where there are seasons in our life where we feel like God is taking a break, in fact, some of the prophets will even say when they didn't see a miracle, they'd say, Lord, awake from your slumber. God is never the one who's sleeping. His people are. The issue is never God, it's us. He has always got his work gloves on, working behind the scenes, which is why patience is an act of faith. Faith that God is faithful. That even in the moments of silence, that even in the moments where it seems like God is not doing anything, that God is at work. 
It's one of the reasons why the Jewish people love the book of Ruth because you don't see God overtly on any of the pages of Scripture in the book of Ruth. But he is behind the scenes working the entire time. And it was this reminder that in those seasons where it feels like God is absent, that he is at work. A frustrating part of parenting is all the moments you miss. You want to see the first step. Hear the first word. Stop the first kiss. But there's moments that you miss as a parent. My youngest snuck his first kiss when I was out of the room when he was three years old. And it was an older girl. And I asked Colton, why did you do that? He said, she tasted good. He takes after his mom's side of the family. <laughs> God will never miss a moment of your life. God doesn't nap. He doesn't blink. He doesn't sneeze. Even in the seasons of silence, he doesn't miss a moment. He doesn't miss a hurt. He doesn't miss a tear. He doesn't miss a hope. Have you ever done something really good and you felt like it didn't get the recognition it deserved? You make this like five-star meal for your kids and they're like complaining and they would rather Hot Pockets. <laughs> Did you not know what I have made for you? I mean, other people, like their taste buds would be doing a standing ovation right now. And you're like, eh, Hot Pockets would be better right now. In the book of Esther, Mordecai saves the king's life. He overheard two employees talking trash about the commander-in-chief. And he doesn't live by the street code of snitches get stitches or snitches get ditches. And so he tells on them. He rats them out. The king is grateful, but there's no reward or public, public recognition. So snitches don't get riches either. Thank you, Donna. Imagine you prevent the assassination of Abraham Lincoln or JFK. You're a national hero, but no one rewards you. There's, there's no real pat on the back. It's not until much later that the good deed is rewarded. A guy by the name of Haman is plotting to execute Mordecai, mainly because Haman is arrogant and Mordecai refuses to bow to him. The night before Haman is going to kill Mordecai, the king has insomnia and can't sleep. And so he starts looking at his diary. And in the diary, he sees about... Uh, uh, Haman, uh, not Haman, Mordecai helping him out. It's too many names here. Mordecai helping him out. And he's like, did anyone ever do anything for Mordecai? And they're like, no, no good deed was ever done for him. He's like, all right, I'm going to give him a reward. And he hooks him up and he hangs up Haman. Just because you don't get recognition now doesn't mean that God's forgotten about you. Your good deed will be rewarded eventually. God's silence doesn't mean he's not working. God's delays are not God's denials. God is never too tired for you. He doesn't say, I would help you, but after raising from the Jesus from the dead, I'm just so tired. Because of the ascension and all the miracles in the book of Acts, I'm just worn out. When God says no, it's never a power issue, it's a purpose issue. It's never can he, it's should he. Psalm 121, verse 3 through 4. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel neither slumber nor sleep. Yesterday, some of us went to feed my starving children. It's about 35 of us from the church who went out to serve together to help out hungry kids. We helped pack 70 boxes. That means there are 41 kids who will have food for an entire year. Just because of one hour's worth of service. But here's what I kept thinking about. Is that there was someone in another country who's praying for a miracle. And here we are in Libertyville, Illinois, being an answer to that prayer, and they will never meet us and don't know. In the same way, there are times when you are praying for God to do something and you have no idea what he's doing on the other side of the planet or what he's doing within his kingdom that is aligning so that that promise can be fulfilled. 
But you have to grow into it. You have to prepare yourself for it. No good thing would he withhold from those who walk up rightly. Notice the conditional statement there. No good thing would he withhold from those who what? Walk up rightly. If you're not walking up rightly, you can't expect all those good things. You never know what God is up to. We win at life when we trust God's process, when we're patient with his timing, when we worship more and worry less. 